with aquaponics being what it is, it's a multifunctional, multi-yielding system that's energy efficient. If we're considering water to be an energy source or a resource as we do from the permaculture context, it's extremely efficient. Welcome to Visionary Aquaponics, a podcast dedicated to inspiring a global aquaponics movement for food freedom, water wisdom, and permaculture-inspired aquaponics. Keep listening for the best advice from the world's pioneers and visionaries in backyard and commercial aquaponics. And now, here's your host, Maribu Latour. So, Connor Jones, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started with aquaponics? Sure. I am 23 years old, and when I got out of high school, I got into permaculture. Well, it was actually shortly before graduating. I kind of stumbled upon permaculture, and it set a course for my further education. So permaculture was a segue into aquaponics, being that aquaponics falls under the context of permaculture, in that it is something that takes care of the earth, takes care of people, and produces a surplus that can be distributed. So what kind of took me specifically into aquaponics after that point was my 20th birthday, I got got a book on aquaponics from a family friend and my dad actually took the book because he was so curious about it and read the whole thing and by the next month him and I had designed our system and we were laying the foundation for it. So it was actually the inspiration that my father had about aquaponics that made it so that we were putting it to practice here. And my dad, he's interested in in permaculture and it's it's a way of life and a way of looking at the world that makes sense to him now. But his background is in fire suppression systems, so fire sprinklers in commercial buildings. So to merge his understandings of plumb systems and moving water and apply it to the permaculture context, aquaponics is the bridge. So that's the background here for me and East End Eden with aquaponics. So could you go into a little more detail about your two projects, East End Eden and Ojai Permaculture, and, and how they relate and the differences between them? So East End Eden is the home farm where I live, and it's a permaculture demonstration site where we host workshops throughout the year and farm tours, and it's, it's where people can come and see it in action. And it's where the, the people who do stay here can live the lifestyle. And Ojai Permaculture, for one, it's it's the website that we use right now to get what we're doing here at East End Eden out to the world. But it's also the larger vision for it is that it is a uniting website domain and also an overview of the network of permaculture that's establishing itself in Ojai. So, what I'd like to do with it is is bring everybody in Ojai that's showing a good example to into the spotlight using the Ojai Permaculture name. Awesome. I'm a permaculturist myself, and I, I love to know how people are combining and integrating permaculture and aquaponics, and I would love to know more about how you're doing that on your farm. With aquaponics being what it is, it's a, it's a multifunctional, multi-yielding system that's energy efficient. If we're considering water to be an energy source or a resource as we do from the permaculture context, it's extremely efficient. And so, of course, it fits into the ethical context of permaculture. And it's very effective and important in climates like ours here in California, where a system like ours could feed up to 15 people throughout the year with fish and vegetables on about a thousand gallons of water recycled. A commercial organic farm could use 800 gallons in a minute irrigating crop fields, depending on the scale. But it sure does take a lot more than a thousand gallons of water to feed 15 people in the current agricultural situation. The way we integrate permaculture and, and sort of the bigger picture of what's going on on the farm here with our aquaponic system is that it feeds more than just us. So the system feeds chickens, it feeds goats. We're raising worms in the grow beds and we have worm bins inside the building. It's a microclimate for propagation. So we propagate a lot of trees in there that we then plant out on the broader acre of our landscape. And we also use it to start 
seedlings that we plant out for annual vegetables. One of the newest experiments with it is growing fodder for cattle. Excellent. I've been really interested in also growing seeds and propagating trees for the landscape for more holistic mm -hmm. land management. And that's really great that you're doing that there. What kinds of trees are you growing for your permaculture mm -hmm. system? So what, what I've experimented with right off the bat, which was kind of a guaranteed easy one to propagate, was willow because it appreciates the riparian habitats and where there's high groundwater. So that was a really easy one to start with. Same with cottonwood. And then I, I've also experimented with other fruit-bearing things that are somewhat easy to, to propagate from cuttings, mainly goji berries oh, are wow. very easy to propagate in that system. And they actually root and establish very quickly and pretty high yielding. And so anything that's pretty easy to propagate from tip cuttings will do in there. Figs, I've done mulberry. We have moringa in mm. there right now. And, and it's about working how, working out how deep to, to nestle things into the, the grow media or if you're putting a direct cutting straight into the, into the media. Cause what we'll do is we'll, we'll create a sandy potting mix and then put the cutting in that and then put it down just enough so that the, the bottom of the pot is wicking some moisture out of the bed as to not rot out mm -hmm. the, but still give it even consistent moisture so it can root. So how many trees have you been growing and planting in your landscape from your aquaponic system? I would say at this point, we've had success with quite a few willows, maybe like 25 or 30 trees at this point. And it's something that we're just kind of getting into further with like the moringa that's in there. And then there's a whole bunch more willows that I just put in. So we've just kind of, I've gotten through the experimental phase and I know that it worked. So now I think it's something we're going to kick in do a little bit more production as we just we started an outdoor nursery too and we've got about 400 trees in there of varying different varieties so nursery is something that we're focusing on a little bit more now so have you found that some trees work not so great once you start them in an aquaponic system and then try to transplant them in the ground yes that's exactly the obstacle that i've faced it's a it's a unique growing environment to be flooded with water every hour in the situation that we have, it creates a whole different kind of root system. There is a shock factor that happens for things that are directly propagated from cuttings into the grow media. That's why I'm kind of excited about doing them in pots just nestled in to the media maybe an inch or so so that they're wicking moisture but they're not developing water roots. They still have soil roots so they're getting the benefit of the nutrient and, and even even soil humidity. But yes, I've lost a lot of things that I've planted out directly. And so that's the refinement process that was a recent occurrence for me. How do olive trees do? Have you tried that at all? Or I know they're Mediterranean, so they probably don't like too much water. Yeah, I would guess I put some in directly into the media and they just rot it out. I do know like our neighbors are the Ohio Olive Oil Company and they have propagation trays for tip cuttings and they have, well, they used to have a propagation system that would miss the cuttings every half an hour or so. So I know during that phase, they like even moisture, but I think being submerged doesn't necessarily work for them. But I, again, I think they'll work well if they're in pots kind of on the surface level. And you're using pots with just sand or are you combining that with compost or soil or, or biochar or any of that? Yeah, it would be a, a sandy potting mix. So sand, perlite, compost. And so what kind of system are you growing? Do you have deep water culture, a hybrid system with media beds or what? what does your system look like? Our system right now, we're not doing deep water culture, but that's something that I'd like to get into in the future. Currently, we have four livestock tanks, three of which are 300 gallons, and then another is 150 gallons. And we have those cycling through beds at waist height that are double reach. So it's about, they're about three feet width. You can reach the middle from either side. It's in about 520 square feet. And we're raising catfish. We were raising bluegill, tilapia, gold carp, koi and goldfish, as well as gambusia minnows as a food source for the predatory fish. You were growing bluegill. What happened there? Did they not work well in your climate or in that system? 
yeah, like the tilapia, they they I I was just observing that they were a little bit more sensitive than say the carp and the catfish, which are super hardy fish, and they appear to make the best use in omnivorous diet, whereas the the bluegill I think struggled a bit because they're insectivores and we weren't at a place of producing the ideal diet for them. Because one of one of the things that we're trying to do here is get off of the monoculture system that would be providing food for our fish. And that was a hard adjustment, I think, for the bluegill because the, the pelleted food that we were using initially was fine for them, but it wasn't fine for my standard of what I wanted to be purchasing as an input for the system. Yes, they, they suffered from because of that. And I think eventually competition got to them and they were the weakest ones. We have communal tanks too. So there is a little bit of competition with the catfish especially. And I think they started to predate on the bluegill at a certain point. So all of your fish live together in the same tanks or do you have any of them segregated out? We do have the largest tank is about 350 gallons actually and that has all of our largest catfish in it so that's anywhere from 10 inches and up and it would probably max out at this point about 15 15 inches would be the longest one we have in there and after that point we harvest so we keep the big ones separated and then the but the small catfish and the koi and gold carp they work well together they get along just fine. Do you keep your tilapia separate? So we did have the tilapia separate and we're not raising them anymore. There's a little bit of question about the legality of it in our county to maintain the water temperature that they were needing to put on weight and to be in their ideal circumstances. It was a little bit too much energy than we were willing to use. Taking the permaculture approach of, of low energy systems with a high yield Catfish were the right candidate instead of trying to force the function of raising something that needed a heater. Okay, so your water was too cold for the tilapia. Yeah, it was too cold and they weren't putting on weight as quickly as we would have liked them to. So it just kind of, for us, the catfish were putting on weight just fine and we didn't have to heat the water. So it was an easy choice. What is the average temperature of the water in your system? I mean, I'm sure it probably changes a little bit year round. Yeah, it definitely fluctuates. So the way our system is set up is it's not a it's not a completely enclosed greenhouse. It's a screened in, but it's a it's a clear plastic sheeted roof. So it is warm in there and it doesn't freeze. So in the summertime, the water temperature is in the 70s, mid 70s. But in the wintertime, spring, winter, fall, pretty much, it's in the mid-60s. So it was kind of, it's not a whole lot of temperature to bring up, but it still was significant enough to make it a better choice for us to keep fish that can tolerate colder water. Right. So you have more of like a half outdoor system or slightly less enclosed, not fully protected from weather conditions? Yeah, I would say the best way to define it is it's an it's a open air system, so air can move through. We have good airflow in there, so that reduces issues with mold and, and different mildews that would be an issue. But at the same time, it creates a frost-free microclimate where we can grow summer vegetables in the winter. So we've had tomatoes in there all year. So what are the ideal temperatures for tilapia? Well, as far as I understand, once it dips below 70 degrees, they start to really slow down, almost like a, a hibernation process where they just become less active. They're not feeding as, as voraciously as they would, and their body can't metabolize the energy that they're receiving from their food as efficiently. So that's that's what I understand. So if you can keep it above 70 degrees, they're pretty happy. And so the catfish, the gold carp, and the koi all are much better suited for colder, slightly colder water, like in the 60s or 70s? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the 70s is sort of like a range where all fish are pretty, pretty happy, unless you're talking about trout, which absolutely needs colder water. But for all of the fish that we're mentioning here, I think 70 degrees in that range is optimal for efficient conversion of food into weight. 
and for active feeding. But when it dips down five degrees less, they're still very productive and they're not affected like a tilapia or a subtropical or tropical fish would be. Are your fish breeding by themselves or do you help it along in any way or keep the most of the parents, the, the larger fish separate from the smaller fish so that they can, so that they're not eaten by their parents? So the only ones that we're actively breeding right now are the gambusia minnows, which a single mother will give a live birth of about 400 babies. And those, they'll also eat the fry, but they're in a large enough tank where the fry can can evade predation from the larger ones. And giving them the root system of water hyacinth is really helpful too. But those, again, are, are what we're raising to feed the predatory fish. So our predatory fish and the ones that we're eating, we're not replicating yet. They're not in a system where they can self-replicate. And so that's part of the larger context plan for, for our aquaculture systems outside of the aquaponics. So we have a few other ponds on the farm where we've, we've selected some of the larger, about 50 larger catfish that we've put in ponds to grow out and to potentially spawn. And then we'll collect the fry out of those ponds and grow them up in the aquaponics system. So we talked about fish and we talked about growing trees. Do you use the overflow of your systems or do you have an overflow route for plants in the ground at all? We don't have any overflow right now. It's all direct cycle from bed to tank. How many gallons of water are you cycling through? About a thousand gallons is being recycled every hour. And so are you using bell siphons or what? Yeah, actually we're using bell siphons and to correct what I said, it's actually two and a half times an hour that it cycles through. That's about the timing for for the beds to reach the fill height and for the bell siphon to to start its process. So what kind of plants are you growing besides trees and you said water hyacinth? What what other kinds of vegetables and plants are you growing? So the water hyacinth is in is in the tanks and that's fish food and habitat. So in the grow beds we have we have a few different things and I've I've experimented with all of the the typical garden vegetables that you would want to grow. And my findings so far, based on also the chemistry of our water at this point, which I haven't checked for a bit, so I think our nitrates are relatively high, is that fruiting plants like melons and tomatoes and peppers tend to produce a lot of foliage and not a whole lot of fruit. So what I've done to appropriately put a plant in the right place, so to speak, is we've mainly focused on leafy greens, chard as being one of the absolute superstars in that system, and then semi-aquatic or marginal plants like watercress, mint was extremely successful, and even a few perennial aquatic plants like arrowroot. Mm. There's there's quite a few things. Right now, There's we've got sugar cane, and then like I mentioned, growing fodder for cattle. We have Japanese millet growing in there. So it's still kind of an experimental process of finding out what grows best. But I'm leaning towards things like watercress, mint, and celery, actually. is very productive. Is celery one of those that you can just cut and come again? I think I think that it will. I haven't I haven't done that with our celery. It it got so large in there that we never really needed to harvest a whole a whole stock. So I mean we would just break off little stalks and that was all we needed. Um and the flavor was pretty exceptional of it. Celery is one of those crops that when you grow in the ground in Southern California, it's a major water expense. Mm. Um and so I like to grow those things that I like to eat, but would, if grown in the ground in an agricultural setting, would be an extreme waste of water. I like to put them in this highly water efficient system where they have access to water all the time, too. So that goes for lettuces as well. And, and a lot of green vegetables, leafy greens need even moisture and they like humidity. They don't really like to dry out at all. So they're, I think, the most perfect match. So are you currently selling any of your produce or is it mostly for your own personal consumption? We're not selling any, although we could at a certain point. 
we definitely have enough space to have a few marketable crops locally. But the, the context of our farm here at East End Eden is that we're a, a demonstration site and our major product is education. Mm -hmm. So instead of selling our produce off of the farm, what we do is we'll, we'll organize a workshop a few months in advance and then we will seed particular things in the aquaponics that we want to have a surplus of around the time of the workshop. And then that, that yield from the aquaponics goes to feed the students. And so in their tuition, it's directly factored in that they're buying produce from us while they're here receiving their meals three times a day. Wow, that's a really great way to, to monetize without having to go into commercial production or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So what, mm -hmm. kinds of, what kinds of workshops do you do? Mostly permaculture or do you do some aquaponics design build type of trainings? I would say we're still fairly new to aquaponics. We've been in it for about two years. And so we've taught people about it, but we haven't taught specific aquaponics workshops. I think in the next couple of years, that'll probably be something we'll get into. My dad and I are actually, we got hired to build, to design and, and oversee the building of another system in, in Ohio. So we're kind of still getting our feet wet with, with building and designing aquaponics. And I think teaching will come after that. So most of what I teach is, is permaculture design. I teach two week permaculture design courses that are, it's a certifying course that's internationally recognized. And of course we have coming up next, the, on May 16th and the 17th is an introduction to permaculture designing for drought. So that's a two day workshop, which I like the two day workshops because it's easy for people to show up to those. So how has the drought in California affected your local community? It's definitely become very present in people's awareness. I'm not certain that there's been a whole lot of action on with the municipal water. It's coming from a reservoir that we have within our valley, which is kind of unique. A lot of people don't have a reservoir in their town. But we do. And it's it's definitely people are saying, oh, you know, Lake Casitas is the lowest it's ever been. We need to reduce. But I don't know that it's really hit home yet. But I, I do know that a lot of people commute past the lake and see it every day. And it's dropping and dropping and dropping. And there's new islands emerging out of the water that haven't been seen since the 60s. And so we're definitely beginning to see the extent of it. So are the water shortages not affecting your local crops and fruit trees like the olive trees? Are people not noticing well, a difference with that? Specifically with olives, they are a little bit more water hardy than than citrus, which is the major cash crop here, and avocados, which are the number one cash crop. Citrus and avocados are very thirsty. Right now, the citrus particularly Valencia oranges, are not even a break-even situation after irrigation and fertilizing costs. So a lot of people are switching out of Valencia production into tangerines, avocados, and olives, which doesn't really address the actual issue, which is water. A lot of those things could be changed or it could be solved by different land management practices, primarily keeping the soil covered. So this the situation here in Ojai with conventional production of tree crops is that the, the soil is bare. So it's almost, I would guess, somewhere around 80% runoff when we do have a rain event and then another 80% in evaporation afterwards. So the ground can't receive water. So no matter what crop you're growing, if the ground can't receive water, then it's not going to keep going for much longer when water shortages hit. Yeah, I, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and we've been under drought for a long time. And there is a similar practice with bare soil and a lot of erosion and wind storms and the sun constantly baking baking it into dirt, basically the soil, turning the soil into dirt. That's been an issue for me as well is not enough mulch over our landscape, not enough organic matter covering our soils and protecting them for more water retention. So have people 
woken up to aquaponics in your area at all through your work or any other local aquaponic community ventures? I do know of a few folks that have been inspired by what we've done and gone out and, and created smaller systems. And then there, there were other people that we connected with at the time we were building our system. But it's still a small, it's a small movement in our area. And I think it really needs to start catching on in the, the urban suburban environments that we have because Ojai is somewhat of an agriculturally focused community. People don't see the potential for growing food in the urban and suburban situation. But what I would love to see is a large aquaponic system on an old parking lot where there's no soil, but there's food being produced for a lot of people with a lot less water than the farmers that are growing in the ground. I think that would be real, really shocking for people and a, and a real eye opener. People in Ojai do love their organic veggies and their CSA farmers, and, and there is quite a scene around that. But I know all the CSA farmers have the water bill as their primary overhead. So I'd love to see an urban-based aquaponics CSA. That's definitely the future. I think that especially marginalized communities, food deserts where people don't even have access to organic, fresh produce. There's so much potential, even having juice bars and smoothie bars that are right attached to aquaponic production in the back or inside or on the rooftop, even pizza places. And I mean, it would be so great to see aquaponics at literally at different restaurants around town where you, they grab the tomatoes there or or even using it as a currency among neighbors. There's some people mm-hmm. growing strawberries and some people growing tomatoes, but that way we can maximize smaller production using aquaponic systems in a really efficient way. So what has been your biggest challenge with aquaponics so far? Huh. Algae. We learned very quickly that If you don't keep light off of the water, you get buildups of algae really quick using the excess nutrient that's suspended in the water. So we had some serious clogging that occurred with that. Thankfully, at the same time, the red worms that we had inoculated the grow media with really started to populate based on the amount of food that was coming in in the form of algae. So We've kind of reached this balance point where the worms keep up with the residual algae, but still that was a major issue. And then I I also propagated vetiver grass in one of the grow beds, and vetiver grass used as an erosion control grass in the subtropics, and it can get a root system of, of uh, 15 to 20 feet in depth. Yeah, it's I really... used to grow vetiver in Nicaragua. It's, it's used for like a living swale because it's so deep rooted. And so I wanted a way to very easily propagate it so I could take one one clump and divide it into 30 or so little clumps that I could grow out and then transplant out. I wasn't anticipating how quickly those few clumps that I separated and put in there would turn into one massive clump. <laughs> and so the root system invaded the the grow beds and and actually displaced the water oh. point where it would would start to it would find its way over the edge basically. Did um, you have to remove all of your media and dig up all the roots in order to get some control with that to be able to plant other yeah. things in there? Yeah. Well, first of all, it was extremely challenging to get the better grass out, but we got it out and then ended up having to spray the roots and spray them with high pressure water to get the media to come out and just like dipping them, submerging it in the tanks too. And that helped some of the, the media fall off, which we use the hydrogen clay balls. So the roots are really grabbing those, but it was a good lesson learned and we got a lot of really good vetiver grass out of it. And the whole time it smelled really good too. <laughs> the freight of vetiver roots was really awesome. So you mentioned also that you dealt with your algae well with the worms, but did you did you change your setup so that you kept light off of your water somehow? Yeah, so and and we're still in the process with it. We as part of our permaculture program here, we're always 
on the hunt for building materials that are about to go into the landfill. And we found a pallet of four foot long milled lumber, a pallet stack of of lumber of all kinds, redwood, Douglas fir, treated wood. And so I, I put that to good use, making decks over the the troughs, which made it so that you could walk on them and it would keep the, the light off of the water. And, and that's been and, working you know, so far? Yeah, so far it's really helped to clarify the water and to reduce the the algae and to keep the water cooler and thereby increase the oxygen content. Overall, it's been a beneficial thing. So tell us about the Japanese millet that you're growing for fodder. So that's kind of part of a bigger system design here with holistic grazing. We have located some miniature zebu cows in actually in one of the most drought stricken regions of California right now where there are people without water. Wow. A place called Porterville and there's a man up there that's selling 20 head of zebu cows which are very hard to find. I've looked for about five years and I finally found them and we're going to bring them down here to graze this grass that that we get as an annual yield every year that up until this point has just been treated as a nuisance on the mm-hmm. surrounding property and been something we've used maybe for mulch or just mowed down here but we're about to upcycle it cows and actually implement a whole holistic grazing plan for the the appropriate zones on the property but this year as we all know is, has been particularly dry and i thought well how can i feed these cows throughout the dry of the summer without relying on baled hay from the central valley or any outside sources of grass for them i had some Japanese millet that I'd used at the cover crop a couple of years ago and I wasn't certain of the viability of the seed but I just took it and spread it throughout one of the beds and it came up beautifully. I mean it's like a green carpet in there and I'm excited to see how well it serves as a cut and carry fodder for the cows when they arrive here. Have you considered growing other kinds of things like wheatgrass or microgreens at all? I've considered the microgreens, and and we've done that in the past. Wheatgrass, not so much. But one of the issues right now with with growing microgreens in there is we have an aphid situation. And so we've had a hard time with with tender seedlings in there, particularly of, of anything in the brassica family, which the aphids particularly like when the brassicas are in a warm environment because it's distressing for them. Are you growing things like broccoli or what is this broccoli or brassica? Yeah. yeah. Anything that that is like mustard greens, even arugula, things that are in that root family of of brassicas and crucifers and mustards. Those things that are when stressed by heat sort of put out this sulfurous odor. Like you might have, have experienced that with kale if you get a bunch of kale at the farmer's market and you leave it in your car with the windows rolled up for a few hours in the heat and you open the door, it smells like sulfur. And I've noticed that with the, the things in that family we've grown in the aquaponics being that it's, it's so warm in there. And it seems like it's a distress signal or something that pest insects pick up on and really predate heavily on them. So we can only grow brassicas in the coolest times of the year. Mm-hmm. So I would say that microgreens would be feasible. We would just have to do them in December and January in our system. Sounds like a great winter crop for you then. So what kinds of things do you do for pest management? Do you have predators like ladybugs or praying mantis that you use for aphid control or anything like that? Yes. So we just released a bunch of ladybugs in there. But it's it's a tricky thing. Aquaponics and especially growing in a closed environment like that requires ecosystem engineering, a scenario where the ladybug can be supported in its life process by a lot of other plants and creatures that facilitate that process. Right. So it's it's a tricky thing. And it even goes down to like when we analyze the soil food web or it's not even a soil food web necessarily, but the bacterial 
and protozoan interactions happening in the media when we look at it under the microscope. It's a it's a bizarre world in there that's not really found in nature. So I find that you have to be particularly attuned to how to engineer an ecosystem to get a consistent disease-free productivity in a in an artificial system like that. Do your beds ever get anaerobic or do your worms do a lot of that prevention for you? We haven't had issues with, with anaerobic situations. I think it's because the water moves so frequently and all of the, the tanks have oxygenators in them. So we're well above 8% oxygen in the water, I would say. So we haven't had too much issues with that. And when we've analyzed the gunk, like the biofilm that accumulates on the, the media, we've taken that sludge and looked at it under the microscope. And there's a lot of aerobic, healthy organisms in there. In fact, more than we found in some of our best compost. Yeah. So we've heard, I've heard a lot about how aquaponic water is amazing for soil remediation, mm. especially in Hawaii with, I don't remember what you call it, potato rock, where it's so dry, there's literally no soil. It's just, it's hard as rocks. And having mm. overflow of the aquaponic water to it over time actually softened it and loosened it and aerated it and fertilized it. Mm. So I was wondering if you use any of that sludge for fertilizing your trees or doing anything, any kind of compost work, anything like that. Yeah. So the, the only way I can think of where we, we do that is with the, the worm bins we have in there. We, we have a bathtub that's converted to a worm bin and an old hand washing sink that is filled with very happy worms. And what we'll do is just pour the aquaponic water through the worm bins to keep them hydrated. And then it comes out as tea on the other end. And we'll either take the tea from there and put it in a compost tea brew, like a, in our aerobic brewer, or we'll put it straight back into the aquaponic beds enriched by the biology of the worm bin. But we don't, like I said, we're kind of keeping the nutrients cycling within the system. So we're not there's no outflow, really, with, with our system design. But I would like to have an in an inflow, so to speak, because we have ducks that forage around the perimeter of the aquaponics, and there's sort of a, a food forest and production system that's right by the aquaponics. And the ducks manage that, and they're going around eating insects and weeds and all this stuff. And I'd love to have a pond just out front of the aquaponics building where the ducks can bathe in it and as soon as a duck gets in water, it poops and do quackaponics. Yeah. Where there's a, the loop bringing in nutrients. So the building in essence is sequestering the nutrients of the surrounding landscape just by creating the nice little habitat zone for the ducks out front. So there's always a gain of nutrient without having to do anything. Yeah, I love that idea. I've heard of duck aponics. You, you call it quack aponics. Speaking on permaculture and how you're thinking about closing the loops in your aquaponic system, are there other ways on your farm that you're integrating animal husbandry or agroforestry or any of your permaculture design with your system? Yeah, I mean, aside from propagating the trees for our agroforestry system, I, I mean, I'd say I've got a lot of plans in the future for the aquaponics building, which involve raising animals in there and making use of the microclimate as well with other subtropical plants placed in, in the corners and niches in there where it's sort of neutral space. But what I'd ideally like to have in there is a grassy floor and not a lawn, but like a sort of native pasture in there. And then underneath the tables where it's cool and relatively humid, raise rabbits for meat and egg laying quail, which are insectivores. So they'll cruise around eating, eating different insects, spiders and pill bugs and earwigs off the ground. And then also raise oyster mushrooms in the humid and warm environment in there. Oh, wow. That's very original. And I love the integration with permaculture and, and mushrooms and different animals and stuff. So that's, that's really helpful. Mm. I really want to inspire other permaculturists out there that we can integrate our permaculture systems with aquaponics and that they don't have to be separate systems. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I was just going to say that what you just said is right on. And, and I think that is the way to maximize productivity. Anytime we want to try to segregate systems that have the opportunity of being 
collaborative and integrated, we miss out on a chance to exponentially increase the yield. Right. And that goes back to the edge effect. When we're looking at aquaponics, kind of like designing like a river or a creek Mm. in a man-made container ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're calling that closed loop, but it still requires inputs and it still gives outputs that can go towards other systems. So if we can integrate different systems like animal husbandry Mm. and and agroforestry and mushroom cultivation and using the microclimates in the greenhouse to produce Mm. a lot more biodiversity, I think aquaponics is incredibly visionary because it gives us the opportunity to use less water to grow some of those things like the mulch or the fodder or even biofuels and things that would require a lot more water and energy to grow in the soil but we can still support those systems that are soil-based or land-based. Totally agree with that. And I think sort of the next, the new frontier of aquaponics is is understanding nutrient density and the crops that we're producing from these human-managed systems. So one of the things that we're doing is is periodically testing the BRICS level of, of the leafy greens that we're producing. And it's been, it's been relatively low, but I, I do know that nutrient density requires a bit of time to build the, the biology and the mineral cycling in in the growing media. And that was one of my major questions about the viability of aquaponics is, can it grow food that can support a human body when we've for so long evolved to eat things grown in soil, which has the full spectrum of minerals and biology that are facilitating growth. So that's my curiosity is, is testing the BRICS level and the nutrient density and doing the microscopy and looking at the biology that's present in that aquaponic water and understanding why it's so beneficial in the, in relation to the story that you shared about it remediating soil and Yeah, I've had people ask me the question about nutrients and whether or not foods grown in aquaponic systems are as healthy as foods grown in the soil and whether or not they have the the trace minerals and and all the different stuff that we can find in in really, really healthy soil, which is not to say that most of our food comes from really healthy soil, but is the idea of it being in water, can it attain the same characteristics of food grown in really healthy soil? And that is still a question that some people ask. When you look at lettuces and leafy greens that end up lasting a much longer shelf life than soil grown produce, it makes you wonder about the the life in that leafy green. And if it can last so long, then it's got to be a super healthy product. Right. I think that has to do with the well-structured and oxygenated water that's going into it. I think water has a lot to do with with the health of, of the food that we are consuming. And I think a lot of times the crops that, for one, are grown in, in depleted soils with water that is not very healthy water. It's not living water, so to speak. And it's it's actually biocidal water most of the time yeah. and all that. No no question there why the embodiment of that, meaning the crop, doesn't last long once it's taken from its source. And I have noticed that difference with things from the aquaponics. They're much more hydrated and they hold their water longer. In regards to when we were just talking about having a closed loop system, we're talking about aquaponics as a closed loop system and how the, that isn't always the case. It's closed loop in that the water is being circulated, but that's really the only way because the nutrient that's being taken and eaten by people is either being flushed away or in our case, it's going into a compost toilet, but we're not necessarily putting that nutrient back into the aquaponics. So that part could be observed too is like, how do we, how do we reintegrate the nutrient the acquired nutrient from what we're eating from the system and loop it back in in a way that's reasonably sanitary and sensible. Number two is what are we feeding our fish? Yeah, I was just going to ask you that. The the whole fish food industry is not exactly sustainable at all, and it's what most of us rely on for feeding our fish. But there are a lot of people out there who are growing black soldier fly larvae and crickets and duckweed and all kinds of things. And I was wondering if you are doing any of those things or using your compost to grow some of those things or Mm -hmm. if you have any plans to so that you can start 
feeding your fish with locally sourced waste products and, and living insects that they want to eat? I've tried to work on that from a couple different angles. Number one is, is growing red worms. It's too easy growing red worms. And I think we could pretty comfortably sustain the fish population we have right now with the red worms. But I also like to provide them with a little bit more of a dietary choice. So we do grow the duckweed as well. That's sort of for the omnivorous and the vegetarian fish. And then we raise the minnows, the gambusia minnows, which are less of a food input at this point because we're still working on the breeding of them. And then we do raise black soldier fly larvae. And I've had like the biopod harvesting system and I've had mixed results with that. But I've actually found that Black soldier flies' favorite food is humanure, and they occupy the compost toilet. But figuring out a way that, that I feel comfortable with taking right. those soldier flies, whether, whether it be that they're self-harvesting into a bucket out of the compost toilet, or if we figure out some way to get that nutrient back into the system, then it would feel more closed loop. The red worms that live in the media their their biofilm has been proven to kill and consume coliform bacteria on contact. Yeah, so that's hopeful. <clears throat> but it's also in the relative location of where our humanure system is and where our aquaponic system is. We would have to be carrying soldier flies from one place to another. Maybe we'll figure out a way to raise the soldier flies closer to the system or within the system on the nutrients of the system. But then another way that I've been feeding the fish is when we process the livestock that we raise outside of the system here, we'll take things that we're not going to eat, which is a few things, not much, but some stuff, and we will grind it up and essentially make a ground meat that we'll feed to the catfish, which they absolutely love. And then one of our waste stream interceptions that we have going on here is organic coconut, which is provided... (laughs) <laughs> by a friend of mine who goes to Los Angeles once a week, and that's for his job, but he makes a stop in Venice Beach at an ice cream shop that makes coconut milk ice cream, and they go through a lot of coconuts every week, and we end up with, I would guess, somewhere around three to 500 pounds on a weekly basis of shredded coconut and coconut still in the shell. And the shredded coconut goes to the fish, and they really enjoy that as well. Okay, so I've got that you're feeding them, you're feeding them red wigglers, you're feeding them gambusia minnows, you're feeding them shredded coconut, and also Mm -hmm. you're thinking of a way to get the black soldier fly larva process going so you can feed them. And also you were mentioning plants left over. What kinds of, what kinds of plants are you giving them? Besides the duckweed, Um, which I also want to ask you about. Yeah. So we've given them chard and different leafy greens that we just sort of dice up and watercress as well. They don't tend to prefer those over the other more bite-sized options, but it is a backup. And what I prefer to do is feed the the extra veggie scraps to the worms and then they'll upcycle it and we'll feed the worms to the fish. Okay, great. Do you have any issues with duckweed overpopulating your system at all, or do the worms keep it down? Or I mean, are the fish eating it enough where it's not a yeah, problem? I, I I have an issue producing enough duckweed right now because it's such a valuable food source, and we do have ducks, and we do have a lot of fish. So I I've got other ponds that I have to keep closed off so it doesn't get eaten. But it's an amazing resource here because it grows so fast. And we also have azola growing with it, which is a floating fern that's actually a nitrogen-fixing fern. So it nitrifies the water and helps the duckweed grow. And it's like 40-something, 50% protein by weight, I heard. So that's a, But that only grows in the summer here. So it kind of has a die-off. It's, it produces spores, and then it dies off, and then it comes back when the water temperature is right. And then... There's, there's one more piece to that, that, that salad of those two plants as a fish food. In our ponds outside of the aquaponics, uh, it serves as habitat for these, shri- these tiny shrimp that are California native shrimp. And they grow in the duckweed azola combination. And so the fish get shrimp and salad when we, when we net <laughs> that stuff out of 
side ponds and bring it into them. They eat the shrimp? Yeah. And do any, so none of the shrimp end up living in your system and, and, and reproducing there? No, it's, that's one of the things about aquaponics is you can't really create an ecosystem of, of different trophic levels. It's really just fish and algae. It's hard to create the habitat for anything else to grow when we need to have the, the stocking density of fish to produce enough nutrients for the veggies. So it's pretty rare that anything other than fish of an equivalent size with one another can survive. I'd like it. I'd like to see a fully functioning ecosystem within an aquaponic system, though. That would be pretty impressive. Well, I, I know people who are growing prawns and, and other types of critters, but they keep them separate from the fish. So that they live in the deep water culture system, and you have to keep them separate. Otherwise, they fight each other and kill each other. But uh-huh. it's another product that you can get out of the system if, if you give uh-huh. it the right space, the right conditions. Yeah. One of my curiosities, too, is raising crawfish because they've naturalized in this area and they're very prolific uh, reproducers and they'll eat just about anything you throw in there. That's one of my next experiments with it as well. Are you planning on um, extending your system into a deep water culture bed as well to have a hybrid system or creating a whole other system that's just deep water? Yeah, and I've talked I've talked to my dad about that because he was he was doing a lot of research on deep water culture last year, and we had sort of a tentative plan for how we were going to do that. Um, but I think coupling deep water culture with the integration of ducks is what I'd like to do. So having a pond out front that's reasonably deep that the ducks can access a certain section of to add nutrient to is probably what the next phase would be in regards to that. So what is the biggest mistake that you think future aquaponics entrepreneurs and activists should avoid? Absolutely know that when there's sunlight on the water with high nutrient loads, you get algae and it can back up the system and cause a lot of maintenance issues. So I think shading the water and keeping it cool is crucial. And then having a backup system for oxygen in your water. In case the power goes out, in case the grid drops, have some backup power source, whether it be a generator, a solar battery bank, something to as a backup so you don't, because you can lose everything really quick. As soon as solved oxygen levels get below a certain point, all the fish die at once. And then also know in your municipal water, right? Because mm-hmm. we've had where we've been, we've been filling with well water. We have a well on our farm and and the water's perfect coming out of there. It's like 7.5 pH, like really nice alkaline water. And it like comes in and it buffers nicely with the, the pH of the water that's already in there. But there was an accident where in our plumbing, the municipal water got into the storage tank for our well water. And we went to fill the tanks. We lost probably half of our fish in less than an hour from oh, the chlorine. Nice. I did an experiment with our well water and the tap water that got into our tank and the well water had no issue right there was that was the the goldfish was the control so i put a goldfish in each bowl one with well water one with the municipal water the one in the municipal water was dead in less than five minutes (sighs) yeah and chloramine can't off gas like chlorine can there you there's a whole other process to removing that I i don't remember what it is yeah, it's, it's bound to ammonia, chlorine and ammonia combination or something. And it, it will leave over time, but it's not like how chlorine, you can just aerate it for 24 hours and it's gone. One thing that we do use when we're irrigating with the municipal water that can complex the chloramine, meaning like wrap it in a carbon chain, is humic acid. So that that protects your soil biology from the chloramine if you can inject humic acid into the irrigation line it complexes the the chloramine which i think we've had some success with also when we've introduced municipal water into the aquaponics we've mixed it with humic acid as a nutrient feed for the system and as a protection wow well are you getting the humic acid directly from the soil or are you getting it as a separate product you buy in a in the store Two sources. There is mined humic acid, which comes from something called leonardite, which takes a while to become soil available or active within your biology because it's like a fossilized humate. 
and the extraction process kind of renders it unavailable for for a short amount of time. So we do use that because it's cheap and it's concentrated when we're trying to irrigate over large areas or uh, when we're really trying to complex the fluoramine for sure. But the other way to get it is from worm bins. The, the kind of the rule of thumb in observing whether you're getting humic acid from your worm bin is like when you pass water through it, the fluid, the tea that should come out of the worm bin should look like 70% cacao chocolate. And then, and if it's lighter than that, then chances are it's fulvic acid, which is also nice, but it doesn't do the same thing. And that, that complex is the chloramine, so it protects your fish from getting contaminated with chloramine? In the few times I've used it, used that technique with adding chloramine water, um, I haven't seen the fish die. It doesn't mean it's not hard on them, and I wouldn't use the humic acid as an absolute guarantee, but I do know it works for soil biology and the biology in the media. Okay. So it protects that, at the very least, from the chloramine. Okay, um, so do you have any resources that you'd love to share about designing, building, growing, harvesting, or marketing for your aquaponics business? You know, it's hard to say. I feel like this process in aquaponics has just been kind of an experience that my dad and I have shared together and, and the other people who have assisted us on the farm. So I would say that the one inspiration we had was Portable Farms, which is, I think, Phyllis and Coley Davis in Vista in, near San Diego. They have a really cool system, and they've been doing it since the 70s. Coley, I think he did university trials and back in the 70s on aquaponics, I think with Cal Poly. And he also has designed pumps for aquaponics that actually vibrate the bottom of the tank to stir up nutrient and, and cycle it in. So they're very well refined with their approach and they really know what they're doing. And you can go to their place in, in Vista and check out this system. You can just set up a tour and it was pretty nice. We just went over there and had lemonade on their porch, and then they showed us the system and very casual, nice people. And that, again, their company is Portable Farms. Yeah, I've heard of them. I think I've been on their website before. I definitely would love to have them on this on this podcast as well. If you knew what you know now about starting an aquaponics system or a business back then, what one piece of advice would you give to aspiring aquaponics entrepreneurs? Figure out a few niche crops that, that like those conditions and focus on them. The things that like growing near the bank of the creek or near the edge of the water are the optimal producers for that kind of system. So I would say focus on those things and, and particularly those things that are really expensive to irrigate with a soil based system, right? So take those things that are costing farmers a lot of money to, to douse with water on a daily basis to get the kind of celery that people are used to and put it in the system that we're talking about and and get extremely high yields with very low inputs, right? So yeah, that that's would be the whole goal of permaculture. <laughs> There's so many ways that aquaponics is evolving today. Where do you see this technology heading in the next 20 years? I think the technology is there. It's It's simple and it doesn't need to change a whole lot. I think we can always be more energy efficient with our with our electrical systems, our pumps and and I, I don't doubt that that will improve, but I think the real technology now that we're learning is how to integrate things. It's not necessarily about improving the function of individual things. It's about putting things together that work together to save energy. So I just see that aquaponics is going to become a much more integrated system and, and philosophy of how to grow food. What related topic do you believe needs the most research, development, and experimentation in the aquaponics world? Producing food for fish on a home scale. Awesome. I think that's definitely one of the most crucial things for making it an, a closed loop and sustainable production system. Do you have any more jewels of inspiration that you'd like to leave our visionary aquaponics listeners? I would just say experimentation, the process of trial and error is, is the best way to learn and is the only reason I can say the things that I've been saying. So don't be afraid to to experience loss and experience the happy accidents that occur with ingenuity and, and inspiration in what you're doing. 
Thank you for listening to the Visionary Aquaponics Podcast. To learn more about aquaponics, please visit our website at www.visionaryaquaponics.com. There you'll find more strategies, tips, and tricks to get you started in your aquaponics journey.